Okay, so now I'm having to uh, uh, suggest this, this idea here that uh, it seemed like to me that a new paradigm was taking shape. I mean, I'm, I'm learning stuff that I didn't expect to see, uh, being, uh, having being doubtful about it, having colleagues telling me, don't go there, that, that can't make sense. Uh, and all of a sudden I think, started to think, you know, there's the whole new paradigm uh, is needed here, new way of thinking. Here's some of the observations just to put my finger on it. Animal protein, but not plant protein causes cancer. It's quite a strong statement I would suggest. Uh, cancer development is reversible by nutrition. In this case, it was being reversed by protein, but we tried some other nutrients, other cancers, saw the same phenomenon that cancer development is controlled by nutrition and involved countless mechanisms. That right there sort of began to distinguish for me the, the idea of uh, nutrition as opposed to drugs. But question, if this new paradigm is true, how do we end up explaining the role for our genes in causing cancer? Or for that matter, genes causing other diseases too? It was, a, it was I mean, I kept seeing things all along here that kept strong, striking that very fundamental belief system that we had. But I was left with this question, how do we explain a role in this case for our genes? What's the truth? Is our health predetermined by our genes or can we override our genes with nutrition? Really important point. And so we had a chance to uh, look at that. And as you may recall in the previous slides I was showing you, we start out with a gene. The gene will give rise to the cancer over time. But we could actually control that gene. We could control that gene just by adjusting the protein level, for example. So it is true too for other nutrients as well. That was merely a first example of how one nutrient, a very important one, protein, was able to control what kind of diseases occur and control the genes. In other words, we can have genes. We all have some genes that uh, do us harm. We have genes that do, some, do us well. We got some good genes, bad genes, if you will. It turns out nutrition, if you do the right kind, tends to upgrade um, the uh, good genes, does good things, and it suppresses the bad genes, just as I showed in that uh, previous slide. That was an exciting concept. So, and now let me turn to you this, this concept that we tend to believe that uh, cancer is a forward, new, uh, forward motion kind of thing. It results from genetic mutations. Um, <clears throat> and these mutations are caused by chemicals. They're caused by chemicals. That's, that's the mindset we all have. We have had it for, for my entire career. And, and quite frankly, still a lot of people tend to still believe this, especially in the public. Cancer is caused by the chemicals surrounding us, environmental chemicals to be old, and that's the chief cause of cancer. It's not really true. It's not really true. They're mischief. They're nasty at times. They can cause cancer, but then they break, they do so by coming in and attacking the genes and corrupting the genes and damaging the genes. Yes, that all happens, and it, it happens on a routine basis. If we eat a good diet, though, with that kind of exposure, the good diet actually tends to keep under control those damaged genes that we might, might otherwise get, and in some cases, it just sort of. Uh, destroys the cancer cells, that is nutrition. So that what I want to focus your attention here on is uh, <coughs> this idea that environmental chemicals cause cancer. That idea arose back in the 1950s when I was still in school. And, uh, but I remember the, the uh, situation at the time. It was kind of frightening. It was a study that was first done among cranberries in New England that was being sprayed with a herbicide. And the herbicide had a compound in it, uh, it was called aminotriazole. And, and so somebody discovered that aminotriazole was able to cause a certain kind of cancer in animal studies. So uh, that led to this idea, and FDA took it seriously, to set up some regulation. Hey, if cancers and environments can cause cancer, we gotta have a program to analyze which chemicals in our environment are causing cancer. We gotta identify them so we can avoid them. And at that time, it was suggested there was like 80,000 chemicals out there by some crazy estimate. And more or less, they just came over the years. So I'm not sure it was ever serious, but it led to this very general idea that our cancer is primarily caused by environmental chemicals. That idea is still around with us. It's still around with us. But with that thought in mind, in the 1950s, the government organized a program, uh, a sperm animal testing program to determine which of these chemicals that we get worried about 
uh, might cause cancer. So what might cause cancer in experimental animals, if you will? They were rats and mice uh, almost entirely. So this program was very formally organized, spent lots of money on it. Uh, and we got busy, the government got busy in setting up laboratories to determine which chemicals cause cancer. Whenever one did, it caused a furor in the public mindset. They usually made headlines, it caused a, a disturbance in the economy of that particular substance that might, that might be used in and so forth. We're still stuck with that idea that most of us think that cancer, that cancer is primarily caused by chemicals. I'm suggesting that I have serious questions about that. I really got caught up in this, this story at that time was one of my chief areas of interest and was working as sort of to some extent at the policy level on these questions. Here's a display of what I'm trying to summarize in this uh, chart here, this graph I'm trying to summarize, what one of those bioassay programs looked like. On the X axis, see some numbers here and they're logs. Incidentally. These are changing by uh, orders of magnitude. This is the dose of the chemical carcinogen given to these animals, okay? There's, the, there's the, the dose of the carcinogen. Here's the cancer response. And the dose of the carcinogen is uh, chosen in such a way that was way above what humans might experience. Here's the level that humans might experience down here. And so they were using, you know, four or five orders of magnitude higher doses just to make sure that if any of these chemicals are right in our environment and maybe it's causing human cancer, we, we actually increase the possibility of, de of detecting this cancer producing activity. So we get some results. In those results where there's a positive response, I'm just sort of displaying here what that might look like. We, these chemicals have a, they're all tested at these very high dosage levels here you can see. If we see a response that's sort of linear in some ways, uh, you know, it looks like, hey, this, this looks real. This, this chemical causes cancer, it's causing cancer. You can see on this axis here. And furthermore, it's a linear response, dose relationship. That tends to convince us that we're looking at something real. If we just had a single point here, that doesn't, not terribly convincing. But we have two or three different levels and we see a line to it that gives us some confidence that chemical is actually causing cancer. However, that line then drawn, after that, then there's, there's uh, the question arises, well, what does that mean for human exposure? Mind you, human exposure down here, down here. So we take the line, we, we argue like crazy, this was going on for like 10, 15 years in the regulatory community. Um, uh, how do you extrapolate this line? How do you estimate what level of, of carcinogen down here might be safe? We get some of these things, we just can't get rid of all of it. So we looked at here and we draw the line down and the argument was whether it came straight down a linear way like this, in which case, if it's true down here, then we can make some estimate what level of, of uh, carcinogen we can live with without, let's say, experiencing more than one, million, one millionth of a chance of getting cancer. So there it is, this line come down there. And we could also argue too, and it was at that in those days, that maybe it just sloped off. And you know, there, there, this is just for the high doses, not the low doses. And uh, all that in here is not so bad. Uh, this was the industry down here making another kind of argument that we could tolerate a little bit of that stuff uh, and not worry about it. But you can imagine that was a very, very tense argument for a long period of time. Now, as I say, the human dose exposure is down here, really quite low, very low dose. It turns out the casein effect, when I put casein in on this graph here, the casein effect is increasing cancer dramatically down way down here in the levels that we consume it. This therefore just opened up a vast new, I don't know, a, a bone of contention in a way. I was showing that the casein, as a protein in this case, an animal-based protein, was turning on cancer at the levels we consume it. Far, far different. No, no relationship to the question concerning environmental chemicals. That in turn is what led me to become quite enthusiastic about the idea that maybe for this and some of the previous stuff I showed you, enthusiastic for the diet that cancer is more of a nutritional disease rather than a genetic disease, even though genes are important. I mean, genes, we start with genes and eventually leads to that. That's not the question. That's not the question. It's you know, how we keep that nasty stuff under control and how we keep the damaged genes from you know, under control. And so, or oh, this is one of the papers I wrote at that time. I'm certainly showing you this to express my, my frustration, to be honest about it. 
Um, this was published in 1981, that's 40 years ago. I had a couple other papers at that time uh, calling attention to this, working with the FDA, spoke at all the, the three major laboratories in the world, two in the United States, one in the United Nations in France, drawing attention to their, their uh, attempt to identify all these chemicals that probably are not terribly important, not for cancer at least. They cause other problems we need to know about, but in any case, not for cancer. They didn't want to hear that. As I was told by the director of one of the laboratories in North Carolina, when I went down the library, she said, Dr. Campbell says, he was, he was the director and he says, you may be right. He says, but you have to go all the way, all the way to the White House to get change. We're not going to change. I learned that was a lesson. I tell you that because in fact, that's what that's what's the state of affairs. These ideas get fixed in place. Once they're fixed in place by governmental regulations or fixed in place by just our general paradigm, the way we think, it is hard to dislodge it. Then we have a lot of people who just automatically want to display uh, things. And so uh, I call that that program still existing today, not as robust as it once was. They're finally to be, beginning to re decline somewhat. Uh, it's been a vast waste of government funding and a misdirection of our attention. So, um, still to add more, a little more uh, questions about all of this, um, we tend to use chemicals, by the way, to treat cancer, as you know. It's called, uh, uh, it's called uh, chemotherapy, uh, one of the kinds of chemotherapy, at least. So we use ke chemicals to treat cancer because if the assumption is made that the cancer is the result of mutations, you know, damaged genes, they never reverse. Well, how do you how do you how do you deal with that? You know, if that's the if that's the case, the only way that has evolved over the decades is that the only way we can control cancer, therefore, is to develop some drugs to kill the cancer cells by ignoring a possible reversal, though, by nutrition. We, they ignore that. We have to deal drugs to kill the cancer cells. And we do that by using radiotherapy, surgery, and cytotoxic drugs. Cytotoxic drugs, okay? All of you probably know this. These are the three modes of activity that is used by the cancer industry and the cancer uh, profession to uh, treat cancer patients. Um, and I'm gonna show you some data here on the cytotoxic drug thing. We know something about that, more about that now as we look back. Uh, still, they're still being used extensively. So what I'm about to say is still applies today as it did then, but we got some data now to raise some questions. Is this, is this a good idea? Do we take chemicals to kill these drugs? Mind you, cytotoxic means toxic to the cells. It's very, very powerful. It's very powerful. Uh, so, and that's the way we treat cancer patients. <laughs>